Sharing knowledge is a passion with ISP India, as we believe that knowledge is more powerful when it is shared. Good afternoon. I'm Uday Shetty, and as always, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to another session of Pharma Best Practices webinars. We are very pleased to host today's session by Dr. Thomas on use of 3D printing technology in pharmaceutical manufacturing. This is the 90th session on this platform since the platform was launched in March 2020. We are so pleased that 25,000 professionals have attended our past sessions live and another 60,000 or so have watched recordings of these webinars on our YouTube channel. We thank you for taking your time out for these webinars and for your trust and faith in us. This is what keeps us going. Please do visit our website specifically designed for webinars, pbpw.in. Let me repeat the URL, pbpw.in in the chat. In today's webinar, Dr. Thomas will present a novel melt drop technology where the 3D printed geometry is created by individual deposition of polymer droplets. Dr. Thomas is head of drug carriers at Merck. With broad expertise in the field of solid dosage forms, Thomas provides a deep understanding of formulation development and process optimization in the complex area of pharmaceutical manufacturing. He has a strong background in pharmaceutical industry, including industrial development, GMP manufacturing, clinical supply, research and development. Thomas is a pharmacist by education and holds a PhD in pharmaceutical technology. Presentation by Dr. Thomas will be for about 50 to 60 minutes. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please use the questions tab to type your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me hand over this virtual platform to Dr. Thomas. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Yeah, and let's start with today's talk. Uh, 3D printing of tablets, a new area here of pharmaceutical manufacturing. Today, we will have a short introduction here about additive manufacturing for pharmaceutical applications. Then I will show you the advanced melt drop deposition. What is this system? What is the technology behind? Then we will also see how can we combine additive manufacturing with solubility enhancement, especially looking into the 3D printing of amorphous solid dosage forms? And then we will discuss the future potential, especially focusing here on melt-based 3D printing technologies. Yeah, let's start with a short introduction here. Let's look at the overview of 3D printing technologies in the pharmaceutical industry. You know, 3D printing is a very broad area. There's not only a one technology. We see a lot of different technology platforms here forming, and they are slightly differing on one hand uh, on the system they are using, on the technology, but also then on how you create this dosage form. So also which energies or which additional excipients would you need here in order to create the forms. Let's start here on the left side. We can see some powder-based system where you create your 3D printed dosage forms out of a powder bed. And there is also different technologies. On the left side here, you can see the drop on powder or so-called binder jetting here, where you have a liquid binder. And then you use this binder here to agglomerate each layer. On the other hand, you can use the selective laser centering. This is also something you can see here on the right side where you use an, um, the energy of a laser beam in order to yeah, melt uh, slightly the surfaces and then create your 3D structure out of the powder bed. Another technology you can utilize here is a liquid-based system here on the right side. There's a drop-on-drop -drop deposition or even a stereolithography. There's also a technology. Here you can uh, use the energy, for example, by UV, laser, or even by temperature. But usually this kind of technologies, they need kind of a starter in order to really induce a polymerization. And that is sometimes critical, especially when it comes to yeah, instable drug substances. 
Another very interesting technology that we'll, we'll focus on today are the extrusion-based systems. You can see here, most um, known technology, for example, is the FDM technology, diffuse deposition modeling technology, or even a semi-solid form here created by pressure-assisted syringes. Usually you are just using the temperature here in order to generate a homogeneous melt that you can then use to deposit the individual strands. What are the future potential applications of 3D printing? That is an important question that we need to think of because um, we will see here with the future, we expect, for example, the diagnostic tools to increase. So in the future, you can see um, we get more data of the patients. We will get more ideas on what is their metabolism about, how, how, what, how is, um, is their metabolism adapting to the individualized personalization to the medications and then this will be in the future also linked with digital prescription tools. So that goes well together with the idea of really designing individual tablets for, for uh, individual patients. So that could lead to the design of the tablet that is then translated in the 3D printed form and that lead us here to the personalized medications. The important point here is not only a variation of those, but also a really focusing on the targeted therapeutic effect. So we cannot only vary the dose here, that would be also possible with other personalized systems, but here the advantage would be we can also adapt the release kinetic or even con uh, combine different drug substances. Another challenge that we see especially in pharmaceutical development, is the uh, change of solubility. We can see here um, the BCS class system. On the left side here, you can see the BCS class system. I think you're very familiar with this kind of system in order to classify uh, drug substances according to their solubility, but also their permeability. And if we now look here at the center, you can see the current distribution of marketed drug substances. And you can see we have a high amount here of BCS class 1 and BCS class 2, but the BCS class 1 right now is very high, 35%, BCS class 2 around 30. That are the most important ones here to look into. And you can see the big shift. If you now look at the drug substances in the pipeline, on the right side, you can see the amount of drug substances that are currently in the pipeline in development. And you can see there is a big shift coming up. So the BCS class one will be drastically reduced. Only five to 10% are expected. And the majority here will move around BCS class two compounds. So around 60 to 70% will be uh, having challenges with solubility. So that for us is an important driver also here to look into the 3D printing technology and to combine the 3D printing together with the bioavailability enhancement. That is an important um, yeah, an important breakthrough here to fully utilize this potential. If we look at solid dispersions, it's also interesting to see how were these solid dispersions evolving. First generations rather based on crystalline carriers, so like urea and sugars. The second generation are rather polymeric carriers, and they are usually the well-known polymers that you know from the hot melt extrusion process. And the third generation that is actually what is happening right now here. We see a mixture of surfactants and polymers, surfactants itself, so surface active polymers already, or even mixture of polymers. There's also a lot of movements here looking into tannery systems here in order to create this self emulsifying or surfactant activity. Fourth generation adds a certain controlled release to this dispersion here that can be tackled by release modifying polymers. And that is even moving into the uh, new advantages here of 3D printing. And that's also where we see a great advantage of polyvinyl alcohol as a basic polymer, because we can really combine here this, um, yeah, this strategy here of having a very stable polymer, but then also having a surface activity when it comes to tailoring the release and um, then keeping even low soluble compounds longer in solution. 
That's why we created the product Partec MXP here. That was initially developed for hot melt extrusion. It's the P PVA, polyvinyl alcohol here, hydrolyzes degree between 85 and 89 percent. And then we have a molecular mass of about 32,000. And on the left side, you can see the product properties. So really focus on having a good flowability in order to be able to have a homogeneous feeding in an automatic extrusion system. That is a very important point and we have a very good reliability of the process and can have a very uh, reliable, reproducible results here when we create different batches. It's very important. Another important point here is um, yeah, the thermal, thermal behavior. You can see the TG, the TM, so the melting point of the polymer and the degradation. And we can see we have a very broad processing window here with the Partec MXP. And an important point here, if you look at this graph, you can see the viscosity plotted against the shear rate. So what you can see here is that with an increased shear rate, the viscosity is slightly dropping. And that will help always here the processing, especially if you think about you have your hot melt extrusion process itself, and then you have a downstream here through very tiny nozzles or, or uh, sacrifices here. Um, then this will help here in order to process your material um, in, in these materials. So the viscosity will drop and make it easier here in the downstream. Shortly talking about hot metal extrusion, that is an important technology that we also want to utilize here for this new for this new additive manufacturing. And basically here it's a process with a thin screw extruder here from from the standard pharma procedures, um, which involves uh, the heating, mixing, and melting of an API together with a polymer. You can see the schematic view here of the process. We have the API. Polymer here premixed already in the feeder, but you can also separately dose it later. So here is an example where we premix it before and then have the melting mixing here with a certain um, yeah, mixing um, screw elements here or kneading blocks. And then we have this homogeneous dispersion that we can use for downstream. And the advantages of this process for sure are that it is a continuous process. We can run it solvent free. And there is already very strong process understanding, especially coming uh, from plastics industry. The process is already very well known, very well adapted. So we can easily transfer it here into pharmaceutical industry and it's already there. So that is an important um, yeah, technology for having a continuous process. Yeah, coming from there, we also want to see how can we use the concept here for additive manufacturing. And now I really want to introduce to you here the advanced melt drop deposition. This kind of a new technology that is initially developed here for the plastics industry. And we can see here the system itself, how it works based on the Arbo plastic free forming. And now you can see here on the right side, you can see the feeder, the feeding unit. So we'd have your polymer and your um, drug substance already premixed and dose it here into the barrel. And in the, inside the barrel here, there is a single screw. So it's a single screw extrusion system that is feeding the premixed material here through the different temperature zones. And you can see there's three different temperature zones. And while the material here is passing the screw, the screw is rotating and feeding the material forward here into the yeah, gap here to the reservoir. Then the material here is yeah, getting melted. We create a polymer melt. And then this polymer melt here fills up the reservoir at the end where you can see the screw tip. And now, now something very important happens because in this technology, we don't generate the, um, the pressure by the rotation of the screw. We can generate the pressure by translational movement of the screw itself. So on the right side here, we apply a force and that pushes together here on the reservoir. That's why we can create very high pressures and go up to 500 bar or even higher. And now the important part of the technology is really the outlet. If you look here on the left side, you can see in yellow, that is here the, yeah, the needle. It's a needle here in yellow. And you can see below 
there is the channel of the reservoir and this needle here opens and closes moves up and down here at a very high frequency because here on the top here there is a piezo actuator and the piezo actuator here can be run at a very high frequency so we can really have the piezo actuator running at about <coughs> 250 hertz that means 250 times per second it can open and close and each time it opens and closes we can deposit one individual droplet and thereby we can create our three-dimensional structure by depositing individual droplets so very nice tool um, in order to control the material deposition and to be sure that we can really deposit exactly the same amount all the time how does such a process look like we're starting here on the right side you can see the geometry we have a simplified geometry here for example 10 millimeters few millimeters b planar structure like a tablet this is our target and uh, on the left side here you can see the process diagram how does such a process look like and you have very um yeah different parameters that you need to look into you can see here the melt pressure here in magenta color this is the melt pressure that we used it was around 400 uh, 430 bar we have the pressure at the nozzle tip running and now you can see the screw movement in red screw is yeah, slowly moving forward generating this high pressure and you can see then also the droplet frequency in black you can see in black you can see the frequency how fast does this um yeah does this um yeah nozzle move up and down and you can see we reach a frequency here about 200 the process here is running about 200 220 230 hertz that is when the infill was done and then we have a lower frequency here for creating the surroundings here of the tablets and now here in the in the center you can see the in red the screw movement going very high so this is in fact we're watching now the reloading process where the screws are moving backwards then we have a rotation of the screw and then um, refilling here this injection volume that we can use later on again for printing so around 345 seconds here you can see again we continue the printing process so we were taking about here 15 uh, seconds here in order to refill the reservoir and then we can continue um, the process itself that is in fact illustrating how this concept works and it really shows how homogeneous it is if you look at the melt pressure it's very good control the system itself and the droplet frequency very repeatable that is an important part if you look at the 3d printing technology yeah looking at the strategy how did we implement it here first of all we are we're coming here from the reproducibility we want to assure the reproducibility of the 3d printing technology that's homogeneity of mass and target geometry that's the basis if you assess this technology then an important factor is the mechanical stability we assessed the mechanical properties here of the dosage forms focusing here rather on the breaking strengths and friability because these are very important parameters that we also see from other 3d printing technologies for example the powder bed systems sometimes they have challenges especially when it comes to friability then model compounds we need a smart selection of model compounds in order to assess here the potential as a drug carrier system and to understand really how can we modify the release based on the polymeric properties and we want to achieve at the end the ultimate goal is to achieve an individualization of the release kinetics or of the dosage forms so we want to create target release kinetics here and how can we do that how can we really modify it very simple for each patient for example and we can do that by varying the infill volumes or even pore structures how does that look like here we can see an sem images here of uh, the final geometry you can see here on the top you see an um, sem image of such a tablet uh, we, we choose a tablet with a high porosity because with a low infill volume here we only have a 30 percent infill volume 
for you in order to better understand how these layers are formed. And now on the right side, we are zooming in on a dedicated part of the tablet. And you can see that you have here these uh, filaments here consisting out of individual droplets. You can still see that on the right side. And on the bottom, you can see the side view on how these layers are aligned on each other. And on the right side, again, you can see the zoom. We're zooming here on the individual filaments here that are deposited with the advanced belt drop technology. And also here, you can see they are consisting out of individual droplets. And then you create layer by layer here. So we can see it's a very homogeneous process. And the important thing is, as we have each droplet defined by this process, um, we can really uh, assure that each droplet has the same weight and uh, homogeneity. How can we utilize this technology? We can really vary here the infill um, volumes. And you can see an overview about what is possible. Here we have a comparison between 30 and 100% of the infill volume. And we can vary that. We are, we are the software tools here in order then to just deposit um, yeah, the droplets in a, in a different pattern. And for sure, that leads also to a variation of the surface area and the porosity in between. So that can be a nice tool here to vary the, the target shapes and the target systems. And we did that here just with the Partec MXP. So it's just, just a polymer here in order to illustrate it. But for sure, we also evaluated it with our model compounds. How does it look like? Looking at the mass distributions, that is an important point. First thing for us is really to assure that we can have a certain reproducibility with this kind of technology. And now we are comparing here the target mass. You can see here the mass in milligrams plotted versus the different infill volumes. You can see very homogeneous here for the placebo um, 3D printed tablets. Caffeine, we see a uh, little bit higher deviations, um, but it, in total, it's still within the limits of the pharmacopoe. And also, ketoconus so loaded um, tablets here were working pretty well. So, with all of the tested substances, it's, it's, um, it's very easy to achieve the target and mass distributions. That is an important point here. And to reach this high reproducibility. Another thing you need to consider here is also the mechanical stability. For us, an important factor. And now we are looking here at the diametral compression. So we just compressed the tablets diametrally. We are a texture analyzer. And then we were detecting the max force here in order to break the tablets. Now we can see the force here plotted against the infill volume. And you can see that even for the lowest infill volumes, even for 30% infill only, you can see, for example, we very fast reach 100 Newton and are even above 300 Newton. Then with a higher increase of the infill volume, you can see the breaking force even further increases. And then at 600 Newton, we already reached the limit of the testing device. So you can see it's very stable tablets already at very low infill volumes. That is very good for this kind of technology. We also see another effect. You can see the placebo tablets here in black. They reach already very fast the maximum uh, in the maximum force of the testing device, around 50-60%. And you can see caffeine here is even stabilizing these mechanical forces even more. Whereas ketoconazole, for example, here shows uh, plasticizing effects. So we delay a little bit the maximum force doesn't really matter for the stability as we're already at very high levels, but it's interesting um, scientifically to, to understand how the additions of different drug substances uh, work here, um, especially uh, looking at the transformation of mechanical properties. Yeah, we also assess the friability because for sure it can be very strong stable, but it could be still um, providing high friability. That is something we needed to take care of. That's why we checked also for friability. But you can see with all the evaluated systems, we are still far below this recommended 1% from the pharmacopoeia. So that means we are still also here safe looking at the friability values and we can confirm the mechanical strength here 
and uh, friability is always an important factor, especially if you think about further processing steps. If you want, for example, to add a coating step or a packaging step at the end, you need to have a certain stability. And yeah, that is also given here with this technology. Most important here, um, our ultimate goal here is to utilize this technology for um, modifying drug release, the drug release here, and to adapt it here um, to the personalized needs of the patients. And what we can see here is caffeine released here in percent, always a 10% loaded matrices. And we can see the caffeine drug substance in black as a reference. You can see the caffeine is very good soluble, so it has a fast onset, direct release. And then we can vary the release here depending on the infill volumes. You can see now we are varying the porosity, as we saw before in the scanning electron microscopic image, images here. We were varying the porosity between 30 and 100%. And we can see the effect now on the release rates. So that means we can really follow individual release rates here depending on the infill volume. The right side, you have the same data set, just in relation to the um, targeted um, milligram loading. Yeah, another important thing we want to look at, now we were looking at the um, drug release of a good soluble compound. So that is for us a good driver in order to understand how do these systems really um, release out of the polymer. But now we also want to dive deeper here, dive deeper into the solubility enhancement itself, because that is an important uh, technology that we can combine with the 3D printing in order uh, to create additional value. And here we are choosing um, the ketoconazole as a model compound. You can see the structure here. It's a weak base here, a BCS class 2 compound with a low aqueous solubility. And on the left side here, you can see the PXID patterns here, plotting here the intensity versus the diffraction angle. And you can see now here the crystalline pattern of the model compound. So we have a very crystalline drug substance. And we also see the physical premixture in blue. So the premix here of our polymer with the drug substance still shows for sure this uh, yeah, crystalline patterns of the drug itself. And now these 3D printed tablets here in Magenta, they don't show any patterns uh, anymore that are linked to the drug substance. So we can really see that uh, the uh, drug substance here is converted from its uh, crystalline to its amorphous form. And the halo that you can see here is uh, really just linked to the um, PVA polymer. So that is a big success. We can create an ASD with this kind of technology. But now we also want to see uh, how can we utilize it for solubility enhancement. And this is what you can see here. You can see some dissolution curves here um, where we plot again ketoconazole amount dissolved here versus the time. And you can see as a reference, we also added here the ketoconazole. We choose the maximum loading here, 40 milligram, and you can see it doesn't get into solution. The solution here, yeah, it's very, very low. Whereas for the um, yeah, 3D printed structures, then we can really enhance the solubility here also, even depending on infill, we can increase it. And then at a higher infill, about 70 to 100%, for sure you have a certain delay of the onset because you have um, a yeah, lower, uh, surface area, but then we also reach very high supersaturation concentrations and they are even maintained over, over an extended time period. That is also an important message here. With the PVA, with the Partic MXP, we are really able here to uh, create supersaturation and then maintain it. That is an important feature of the polymer itself. You don't see that with so many polymers. Usually then the precipitation already starts and uh, we have a recrystallization of the drug substance. Yeah, so coming to a short summary here of the advanced melt drop deposition and its application for pharmaceutical industry, we see a, a very new technology that provides a very high accuracy, especially if you look here at the material deposition, 
it's, it's a new technology that really focuses on the material deposition. In contrast to other um, technologies here, we have a very defined process. And as you, as you could already see, the process itself is very stable and can be monitored. I think that is a key advantage here. And it gives us the opportunity to combine additive manufacturing with solubility enhancement. So that can really be a key feature here in a new product developments. Another point here is differentiation to existing FDM technologies, because here we are looking at the single melting step here that is based here in, in the direction of direct extrusion. And we can have uh, very complex forms as we have this high defined material deposition out of individual droplets. So that is also an important differentiation. The technological, the technological status here, we see it is an advanced technology that is already pretty much established in plastics industry. And we see a fast expansion here in other technological fields. And now we could also here address this technology for future pharmaceutical applications. Looking a little bit more into the future, we can for sure enable complex geometries. You can see already here some examples of, of what we are able to do with this technology. We have the high level of edge deposition. You can see that becomes very important if you create um, defined structures, especially also, for example, you can have a breaking edge here. Then you can create completely other shapes, bullet shapes, defined infill or even patterns infill that really uh, are linked even to the brand. Or you could have a thin layers, very thin layer tablets here um, that are already very stable. Or even use a multi-nozzle here in order to combine different drug substances or even just combine different release rates with each other. Yeah, another point here for the future, where can we apply this technology? We can use it for individualization and rapid prototyping. So we know that the personalized medicine will be an important driver for 3D printing technology, but we also see high interest here in the rapid prototyping in pharmaceutical industry, and especially also in the early supply for clinical trial material. And the key technologies itself here, due to its simplicity, the FDM process here can be an enabling technology for early formulation development. But we see the main advantages here also targeting direct extrusion approaches. That is really um, a way we see a lot of um, yeah, companies are exploring. Looking at the growth potential, we see that 3D printing is gaining very high interest within all industrial sectors, actually. And an important factor here that will drive the development in pharmaceutical industry is that the whole pharmaceutical industry is faced with accelerated development timelines. So there will be a high demand here for new manufacturing technologies. And one of them will be additive manufacturing because it really has the potential here to speed up, especially the early phases of development. Also polymer requirements are an important topic here. We see the high terminal stability for the melt-based systems. That is also key, it's a key requirement here. And that's why we chose the PVA here as a very linear polymer, very stable over an extended time also. Another important point you need to consider are the mechanical properties, especially if you're looking into inter intermediates. Not all processes are already this one-step process that you saw today. A lot of uh, processes still require an intermediate, and that uh, also requires a certain mechanical as well as um, yeah, polymeric stability. Yeah, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to, to answer your questions. Thank you, Thomas, Thank for you your presentation. presentation. Mm -hmm. We will we will start the question answer session. So, Smita, should I make you the organizer so that you can read out the questions? Yep, sure. Okay. Okay, now you will see the questions tab on your questions panel and then you can read the questions. 
so delegates please type in your questions in the questions tab and dr smita rajput from Merck will read out the questions and dr thomas would answer them yeah so we have received first question mm -hmm. so uh, the question is from the thomas so can you please comment on formulation of protein based drug using the fdm so question is whether fdm or 3d printing can be used for the protein based formulation Mm -hmm. for, for prototyping rather or yeah for protein drugs or for protein type formulations can we use the fdm uh, technology it's, uh, you mean for protein or prototyping i didn't understand protein protein biologics protein. Protein biologics, biologics. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah for biologics um it is it is a little bit more complicated for sure, we also see a high evolution in the area of, of bioprinting. Um, but the FDM itself um, usually uh, is rather based on, on, on filament based. So the um, filament itself then, for example, is, uh, is melted by the nozzle. And usually this requires high temperatures. So there we see some limitations, especially for, for biologics itself, um, just due to the fact of, of the high temperatures. But there is other printing systems also um, already established if you look into bioprinting. So, so they are working rather um, yeah, with, with uh, for example, gel-like structures, and they don't require this excessive heat. So these this systems can be also interesting for, for the bioprinting sector in, in order to, to print um, proteins or biologicals. Um, there's also a lot of research in, in this area ongoing but it's a little bit um, differing from the FDM. So with the FDM, we're working rather higher temperature ranges and uh, rather at the current stage, let's say, um, rather for the small molecule area. Okay, okay. so uh, 3D printing can be possible, uh, but maybe the FDM is not the right choice for the biologics. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have next question for you. Uh, what infill percentage is desirable for enhancing the solubility of the tablet? So mm -hmm. Maybe the yeah. question, sure. maybe with respect to polypor or. Mm -hmm. Very, very good um, question. Also, as you as you saw, um, we we are able to vary the geometry and for sure the porosity by the infill, and that is a very good tool for for um, our uh, release. And as you could see already from the release, especially if you target formulation that uh, wants to create a, yeah, um, a certain um, yeah, solubility enhancement and maintain this high solubility over time, um, it can be uh, of advantage to also reach a certain release kinetic because, because you can see if the structure overall becomes too dense, for example, it will delay your release slightly, not, not much, but you can delay your release slightly. And that also modifies the release kinetic of your drug substance. Let's say, for example, most of polymers will be, um, let's say, diffusion-based. Maybe sometimes you will have a mix of diffusion and erosion, but you can imagine that at the surface, you will have a slightly up concentration. The concentration of the drug substance then will increase at some point. And uh, so it can be also very interesting to re really have the target release um, speed, so let's say release kinetic, in order to um, further support your solubility enhancement. Because then you really reach a good limit of then um, uh, releasing your drug and not to accumulate it on the, on the surface area because that may induce crystallization again. So that there could be an optimum also for, for this kind of um, approach. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is one more question, uh, which um, is like this: This person has missed the uh, missed the talk somewhere. So he is uh, saying that uh, it is regarding this uh, the infill volume again. So is is any mm -hmm. scaffold needed to deposit the material? Uh, or uh, what is the material which can be used to make the scaffold? So question is whether the scaffold is required, or if yes, mm -hmm. then which of the material we can use for the scaffold? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, we, we can directly use the, the final melt. So, so we are just using the final, the final melt, and then um, we can vary the geometries. Usually, we just have a, an outer layer to stabilize, mm -hmm. 
and then we have an infill pattern that we just follow sidewise. So, so that is um, the standard pattern that, that we are using. And um, sometimes also at the bottom, you can print the one layer um, in order to um, then easier easier remove it from from the um, from the uh, floor structure. But it's not not even required with with uh, the visible polymer that we evaluated. So, uh, but there for sure is is uh, very different options possible. But we can work with the standard geometries. Yeah, so, uh, for example, if we made the extrude uh, extruders or and then we can or yeah, the filaments and then if we can put into the through the FDM, so it's possible. So you don't require the, the scaffold really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can um, you can write this um, for sure. It has slightly influence also on the release kinetics, how you um, how you structure it and maybe even on the stability. Um, you can optimize that. That is, uh, that's for sure. There is, uh, there's different types that you can use, and it will have an, an effect. And and you can also have certain infill geometries. We also played with with the with the infill geometries. They can for sure modify also how fast is your medium entering, how fast is it releasing, and that is also um, geometries you can you can optimize. But their impact is rather minor to the polymer itself. For us, it was more interesting really to focus on the polymer itself and to have an an easy tool. There's much more room to play. Absolutely, there's a lot of uh, room to play with the geometries, especially. Uh, there is one more question. Like uh, this, this technology you're talking about, 3D printing and everything. So the question is from the market perspective. So uh, how many marketed products are there uh, by using the 3D printing, and how the future looks like? And mm -hmm. if you yeah. know the brand, mm -hmm. then please mention the brand name. Yeah. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, no, that's uh, yeah, that's an important question because I mean the the technology evolution will really be driven by the market demand, and um, as you know, it is kind of a new technology, and um, we we'll see already um, some applications. I mean, there is uh, already one marketed product, it should be a term here, from Apricia, for example, that is uh, actually um, built here by. Uh, powder layer or a powder, a powder a jet binding here where you create um, your form out of a powder bed and then you, you spray the binder on top and then you have your next powder coming on so really constructed out of the powder so that is already on the market and we see also um, another company that is very fast evolving here in, in this field is a triastec they are using a melt based approach so they also have a melt deposition where they can really deposit it, and, and they already, um, uh, yeah, filed already an IND. So um, they're also, um, yeah, very active in this field, especially in the melt-based field. And we see a lot of uh, other uh, companies really looking into this uh, technology field. Um, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, companies looking into personalization, especially fabrics is looking into into this kind of uh, evolution. And we see a lot of people being interested in it, and also big pharma companies are interested in it in order to advance their development timelines and to search for a way how to utilize this technology in their early development. So that is also an interesting part of the application. And, and also we are looking at it very versatile from very different angles. We're also looking, for example, in the, um, yeah, in the one serum technology where we really try to implement it, for example, also as a as a service for uh, for customers to support their early developments. We're also looking very broad into it, looking from a recipient perspective, how can we support, for example, pharmaceutical industry into setting it up with the right recipient, the right technologies, but for sure also we're looking into it as, as a service provider. Thanks, thanks, Thomas, for giving the overview about the existing market product and what exactly technology they are working on. Now, the uh, next question is from the commercial or the production perspective, like what production speeds can be achieved and uh, is this uh, expected easy to commercialize? So from the commercialized perspective, so how much easy to implement this technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is also a very, very good question. Because for sure, at the end, we need to have um, a certain uh, yeah, commercialization. And there is different approaches. I mean, there is various approaches currently with this 3D printing. 
you you will have the application especially uh, as let's say uh, really a pharmaceutical production that's the way for example that we see for example Apricia is pushing it forward it's really a, a manufacturing a large-scale manufacturing even scale it up or scale it out um, for, for very high throughputs so you can really meet the market demands that is a very interesting concept then if you look for example into personalized medications the idea is rather to to have the have the end um, yeah that's, it's not the customers but it's like the um, end distributors using it here for example the pharmacies or let's say the um, distribution centers here they create it very personalized there maybe for example the fdm technology can be very interesting so there will be different technologies for different concepts and also now what you saw today the advanced mail drop deposition um, is rather based in the industrial sector because we have still larger equipment so the equipment is rather larger and um, can be optimized also for a larger throughput like the structures you saw for example today they can be uh, manufactured within uh, one or two minutes and then we have just one nozzle running so you can have in the system multiple nozzles and even optimize the speed so you can have three, three nozzles in parallel very simple and then you can um, then increase the speed by by that and you can uh, print much more tablets also on, on one platelet so that can be quite automated and uh, then the idea there would be for example just scaling it out instead of upscaling it and then you can have it run 20 24 7 and create a lot of uh, material just by this and then you have a certain high flexibility for sure in in creating your final form and also the locations that is an important aspect also an advantage to to be considered here with this technology concept yeah and i could see that even in pediatric population as well as you mentioned like different size or the shape so that can also be possible for the pediatric population to to make them uh, to take the medicines so that to generate the interest uh, in such population yeah. Yeah, and now, very important. Uh, yeah, sure. You're saying something, sorry, Thomas. No, no, just um, looking into into the pet, pediatric population. I mean, that is one of the main drivers. Uh, one of the main drivers are really here to to um, yeah make it the life easier for, for the pediatric population. That is very good motivation also from our end. Um, and also for the elderly, really, you, you, you know that they take a lot of medications much more medications than, than the average so uh, also there to make the life easier to combine them that can be a very nice application for the personalized sector yeah so that's a good driver yeah correct absolutely now there is one more question like uh, how the 3d printing technology can be used to enhance the solubility of the poorly soluble drugs mm -hmm. yeah that is um, actually coming from the hotmail extrusion that's also where we are coming from technology wise um, we have a lot of experience with the hotmail extrusion in order to create um, amorphous solid dispersion so the asd generation and um, we are basically transferring the otherwise crystalline molecule here into its amorphous form and then disperse it in the polymer matrix and the advantage is really that the um, the uh, drug substance is then not anymore in a crystalline form. So it is already solubilized in the polymer and then we can um, we don't need this uh, energy anymore to overcome. The, the crystalline lattice energy doesn't need to be overcome. We have it already amorphous and then it can dissolve together with the polymer. That is a great advantage. As you could see for, for the ketoconazole example, we were able here to, to enhance the solution and maintain it after the solution. That is an important point here. Um, that's also the feature of the PVA because it is quite amphiphilic it keeps these uh, low soluble otherwise low soluble molecules then in solution and um, keeps it as long as it's in solution the body can 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 take it in and then you have the bioavailability of, of the drug compound that can be another key differentiation in order to um, to make use of this 3d printing to combine it with the solubility enhancement that that would be a big additional value mm -hmm. okay yeah Thanks, thanks, Thomas, uh, for giving the uh, heads up like how 3D printing can also be useful for the poorly uh, water-soluble drug. 
Now the next question is uh, when you compare the conventional tablets and the 3D printing tablets. So is there any different uh, pharmacopoeial standards for such type of tablets? So that's mm -hmm. the question. Yeah, I mean it is quite a quite a new technology. Um, so we know for for sure there is a monographs on the tablets. That's where everyone is, let's say, focusing on. Where where you, where is your orientation on? And um, usually we are trying to um, yeah to screen also uh, how would our technology, for example, um, um, stand compared to to the standard tableting process. And and we can see we are usually reaching all these these levels. So 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 all the requirements that you would have for for standard tablets we can uh, easily fulfill also with this 3D printing structure. But for sure, it's not the same for all technologies. Like some technologies may not provide you enough hardness or may not um, may differ in some angle. So that is also there's also a lot of room for discussion also later on with the with the authorities during the evolution of 3D printing. Um, this is a big uh, regulatory discussion also uh, ongoing. Um, should they have their own monograph? Um, or how does it evolve? Um, and so far, I think the best is to stay close from the tablet monograph. It, it already provides a lot of insights, but for some dedicated structures, um, they may not fully comply with the 3D, uh, with, with the normal tablet monograph, but still provide advantages. And that is something where, where discussions with regulatory bodies are important. And that's also why we try to be, uh, to create a big community here to, to um, have also regulatory bodies looking into it and to have to exchange with them because um, there may be certain advantages that may be blocked by the standard regulation but could be um, approached better than. So still an early stage, but I mean, with this technology that you saw today, it's easy to, to um, fulfill the standard requirements of, of tablets, for example. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas, for giving that clear indication, like there is a possibility to come up with something different for the 3D printing because the requirement for the such type of tablet is quite different than the conventional one. So we are looking forward to hear more uh, from the regulatory bodies, how they will take up this 3D printing dosage form. Now the question is uh, very similar to what you already answered for the biologics. Uh, here the question is uh, how the 3D printing technology is feasible for the temperature sensitive product development and commercialization. So maybe the mm -hmm. FDM as you mentioned, FDM technology may not be the right one, but maybe there are different ways where you can operate this this technology. But you're expert, you you can comment on this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I can I can comment. There is um also in the FDM uh, technology we see um, a lot of demand for for looking into uh, lower temperature ranges. We, for sure, we we need to let's say look at both ends. Like we now were covering the higher temperature range because we wanted to see the uh, additional um, creation of ASD, we are, we are the formation of an ASD, then it's always good to be at a higher temperature side to create really the amorphous structure. But there is reasons, as mentioned, to go to the lower end also. And that is something also that is needed here. Um, and, and that is also something that is important for, for us also as an excipient provider also to, to look into what is the need? What is the, what is the need for this kind of technology? Where, where are the gaps? And there we believe also uh, lower temperature processing is certainly one of the gaps with the technology that we need to look into. And um, but especially looking into the biologics, maybe FPM itself is not the right um, choice for our biologics because then you would have this two times uh, heating step um, that is a little bit complicated sometimes. So there you would rather go into the uh, bioprinting area where you would, for example, print print gels, jelly structures, or something. Um, that wouldn't have this challenge with the with with the high temperature, but for sure you have other challenges. You you still need to create your final form and then uh, remove the solvent and, and maybe dry it in a safe environment. So there is still complex, but uh, we see a lot of movements in in this area. So um, that can be uh, can be an interesting application within the next years. Thanks, Thomas, and. Um... There is another question. Uh, maybe we can take this as the last question because you are answering so many questions. And uh, so, please suggest like what are the other polymers have been found suitable to use with the uh, 
this this process like APF process it is mentioned. The, I think it's FDM polymers? process you want to say okay. like what are the other yeah. polymers can be found suitable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we we are we are seeing that um, usually the polymers uh, of the that are used in, in hot melt extrusion are explored. And um, we are seeing, especially for the FDM process, for sure you need to look at the intermediates. So that is something we are also looking into. And um, actually some of the polymers used in, in hot melt extrusion um, are designed to be quite brittle because for sure they, they need to be milled down again. And uh, we see that when we create these filaments. So we also perform a lot of studies where we look into, into different polymers and then measure their hardness, measure, measure their mechanical strengths. You can do that easily by, by three-point bending, for example. You have it on the blocks and then you apply a force on top. And then you can see when do they break. And um, we, we're also working a lot with that, for example, with the PVA. We are using the PVA as a basis and then really adapting the mechanical properties then uh, to your target. So we are adding plasticizers, like you can use, for example, polyols, you can use sorbitol, manitol, something in this direction. That gives you very good results. So you can add that small molecules here as plasticizer, and then you can really design also the flexibility of your uh, strands. And that is that is very important here. If you want to uh, succeed here in the FDM development here, um, to, to have that right from the start, the, the right mechanical properties. But, but you can evaluate different different polymers that are used in hot melt extrusion, well-known polymers, but um, really this fine tuning of mechanical um, properties, like you can easily do that with the PVA. That's an important um, yeah, feature for you to, to start your early development. Yeah, so, so your message is like uh, with the PVA, you can play around and uh, you can uh, do a lot of changes and still come up with your 3D printing depending upon your API and depending upon your processes. So maybe you have to do some of the pre-formulation study and then you can come up with your ready product. So, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Thanks, no, Thomas. Welcome. Thank <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Smita, for conducting this Q&A. And uh, before we close this webinar, I will again hand it over to Thomas for his concluding remarks before we close this webinar. Over to you, Thomas, again. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think, um, I hope uh, it was a great journey for you today to, to see how um, 3D printing can be utilized here for, for early formulation development. And I mean, we are just at the beginning of this journey, actually. So, um, I mean, we see the first products now, um, our first companies really focusing on producing medicinal products that are entering the market. So I think it's, it's really interesting time to to be um, yeah to be to be working with this technology, and it is very interesting to connect with with the other people who are working on it to to um, utilize really the potential for pharmaceutical development. And I think in, in the future we will see um, a lot more applications of the technology, especially in the framework of advanced manufacturing. We all know that uh, the FDA and, and a lot of um, yeah, regulatory bodies are looking into advancing um, yeah, the technologies here in order to assure yeah, material supply, to assure drug product safety. And um, additive manufacturing can be an interesting part of this toolbox. And we will see more and more application. We, we see it in a lot of industries, how disruptive it is also, especially if you look in automotive or, or other electronic part industries, it completely changed the entire supply chain um, for sure, in the pharmaceutical industry, it's supposed to happen kind of slower because of regulations, but uh, it has the potential really to, to be a, a driver for, for new evolutions, new developments. Thank you. So thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Smita. Thank you, delegates, for taking out time today and being here today. Please do join us for our interesting webinars, which you can see on our website. Our next webinar is on November 18th. Uh, which is on multivariate data modeling in process validation. So with this, we are closing this webinar. Good evening and have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.